Okay, hello everyone. Here we are already in the end of June, a very rainy end of June, my gosh. And I just heard that the monsoons haven't even started yet. So <laughs> goodness. Um, do you wanna go ahead and do inner or roll call, Mindy? Yes. Ada Anderson? She's here. I see her. Okay. If you speak up, that helps with the recording as, so it's recorded on. I'm here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Andrea Suhaka? Sure, um, Energy Outreach Colorado MOU. So we're still at Active Agency. Okay, was that Andrea? All right. I'm looking. I don't see Andrea. I don't see her. Um, Bob Brocker? He may not be here either. Okay. Um, Kathy Noon. She was having problems with her audio. So I'm, I am going to mark her here. Okay. Chris Lynn? And Barbara Boyer is here. I usually come before Kathy. Thank you, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Chris is here. Don Perez? I'm here. Uh, Gretchen Lopez. Good morning. Thank you. Carrie Erickson. Here. Uh, Phil's on the phone, so I think he, he muted himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean Wood. Sherry Haight Vogel. Steve Conklin. Here. Tex Elam. I'm here. And yes, we do. We old folks do want to own our own homes. <laughs> That's right, Tex. <laughs> Tom Mahowal. Here. He's there. Valerie Robson. There. We know she's here. Yeah, we saw her log in. Okay. And Winshaw. Here. Okay. All right. Do we have any guests on the line? Jim Dale here. I didn't hear you call okay, my name, Jim. Mindy, but gotcha. I'm here. Thank you. All right. And it doesn't look like we have any guests. But Dr. Who is who is MS? N app. We're not getting response. Hmm. I don't recognize that one, Mindy. I don't either. I, that's why I was asking. Any okay. guests? If you are a guest, please unmute and introduce yourself. Hey, Mindy, I think that's Milana with Dr. Cog. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. Okay, all right then. We have Allison Cutting. I was gonna say, Allison is here as a guest um, from Douglas County. Thank you. Okay, is everybody accounted for, Mindy? Uh, we are. I'm just going to go through and check off the Dr. Cog staff that I can see signed in. So we are good. Okay, wonderful. Do we have any public comment? I think we only have one guest. Allison, that means you. <laughs> okay. Just that I love Dr. Cog. <laughs> well, that's a great comment. And let's make sure that gets in the minutes officially. There you go. <laughs> love that. Um, the chair does not have much of a report other than, than to say we're waterlogged, just like all of you guys, I'm sure. And our windows have been leaking. So that's my report of the chair. So we can move right into you, Jayla. I know we have a lot to discuss. First of all, I want to know if you had a wonderful time on your trip. Okay, well, <laughs> we had the best time ever. <laughs> We had the most amazing trip ever. I'll remind you guys, we went, Steve and I went to London, Paris, and Rome. And then we spent a few days out in the countryside visiting my uncle. 
and it was hard to come back because, and get back in the swing of things because of the jet lag. It, you, oh my gosh, I was exhausted. And before I left, and I won't talk too long, but Ada told me that she used to go to London twice a year. And I know why, Ada, I get it now. It's lovely. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. All right, guys. Um, thank you so much and happy Friday. Uh, I am going to talk to you primarily about our trip to Washington. So Doug Rex and I, our executive director, Ron, um, the director of transportation, and Rich Morrow, the director of legislative affairs, we went to Washington uh, last week for just a quick visit, three days. Um, our, our goal was to meet with members, and we did that. Meet the new staff. Oh my gosh, everybody's new. The whole staff are new. Um, uh, educate uh, staff, uh, uh, particularly, and some of the members, some of the new, like Pedersen, you know, she, we had worked with her when she was a legislator here in Colorado, um, and she knows Rich really well, so that was good. Uh, but just reminding folks about the aging of the population, reminding them that we're a fast aging state. The staff could not believe the demographics. You know, we showed some of those numbers and how Ooh. fast the older population was growing in comparison to the um, other two uh, cohorts, the zero to 17 with a 2% growth, um, the, the, the 18 to, to 64, with a 17% growth in the next 30 years, and then 99% growth in the 60 plus population. Um, they were shocked, they were shocked. And I, you know, I feel like I say this every, with everyone I talk to, I say it all the time. And I'm like, how can you not know this? Um, being a legislator in the state of Colorado, how can you not know that our population is aging? Um, but they don't. And so, the more material we can give them, the better. Um, we we're also there to advocate. So Ron certainly advocated for transportation issues um, and talked about, they were real interested in um, the, the projects that we're doing um, and, and, and where they were. And Ron was able to provide a really good um, uh, 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 explanation and show um, the, the projects that, that were being worked on. Um, so that was really good for us. I asked them to specifically support the Elder Justice Reauthorization and Modernization Act. This is a, 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 an act that's being reauthorized. Uh, it would bring increased funding to the Ombudsman program and would bring funding to, for, to address social isolation. Um, we learned a lot about social isolation in, during the pandemic and how deadly it truly is. It's always been a problem for older adults, especially older adults who get more frail, who have physical issues or cognitive issues. All of those things can become way worse with isolation. And so we, we really do need to address that. There's not a pot of money though that's easily um, in, in our funding, which you're gonna be reminded of, um, that can address those issues. Um, it could be in part B, but it's, it would, would be nice if there was more designated funding or more flexibility in the funding. Um, the farmer's bill, we asked them to support because the farmer's bill is big for not only SNAP benefits, but um, Meals on Wheels. It supports and funds elder nutrition programs, and that is uh, critical for us when we talked about that. The Elizabeth Dole Act reauthorization is, um, uh, relates to the Veterans Directive Program, and they're talking about increasing the Veterans Directive Program. I wanna make sure we increase the funding that goes along with that Veterans Directive Program. It is not fair to um, ask us to do more work and not give us funding to do it. Um, and, and then there's a bill called the Chronic Care Bill, which is um, just starting in the process. I think it'll be more apt to go through next year because it's, in, it's been to a couple of committees, it's back in for changes. 
So, but this is a bill that provides money for community-based services like transportation, nutrition, um, uh, some material aid, so things like that. So those, those are separate bills. Um, we also talked about the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, believe it or not, it's up for reauthorization next year. Um, we are just getting, another thing that we talked about, we're just getting the policies and rulemaking for the last reauthorization in 2020. So it's like, come on people. Um, but uh, so I joined a, a committee recently um, uh, to be a part of communicating with the, the powers that be at the administration of community living to, to make some recommendations. Um, really, the kind of the, there are some very specific recommendations, but it's in general, it's about flexibility, um, having more flexibility in our funding. We learned how powerful the flexibility and funding could be during COVID, where we could move money around to places it was needed. And we are back to the old regulations now, which are very formulaic and very strict. And it is not, I feel like I'm going back in time. I do not like it. It feels archaic and we need to change that. Um, and, and then just clarifying some of the things. Again, new programs are required and no new money. <laughs> and it's like, so how are you expecting us to do this, right? The two bills in 2020 went together, the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, and then, and then a bill to increase funding for the Older Americans Act. The reauthorization went through, the new funding did not. So here we are, um, once again, stuck with, um, not stuck, well, it does feel, it feels really unfair to, to be asked to do these programs with no new additional dollars. Carrie. Okay. I just wanted to um, echo what you said about we were able to change a little bit who is talking. Let's see. Can we have everybody mute that's not talking? Might be you, Tex, if you want to mute. No, absolutely. It, it was my speaker all of a sudden telling me something I didn't want to hear. <laughs> That'll happen. Um, but what we saw, Jayla, just to echo what how frustrating it is, is during the pandemic, those regulations were loosened a bit, not to be, you know, lazy, but to meet people where they were at. They were not comfortable going out to the groceries store so we could bring groceries to them and still get some funding to cover staff trips, um, mileage, fuel, et cetera. And now we're not able to do that. And we see a lot of people, they, they do not want to go shopping in the grocery store. They're not so, I mean, I don't think it's pandemic related. I think people are tired. It's a lot of work to go to the grocery store and walk the aisles. They really liked getting the food delivered. Um, so that was just a little I don't know, frustration on my part as a provider because there's no funding for that and yet we're still doing it. And, and Carrie, if I could make a comment too, that um, there has been an uptick in targeting older adults in grocery stores for snatching their purses or, you know, and that becomes very scary. Uh, so in addition to the complications of the pandemic and the ramifications of that. Now we have this uptick in um, mm -hmm. crime uh, targeting older adults in the grocery store. So that's yeah. another factor you might want to recall. Hear people Thank you, Gretchen. Fearful about being on the roads these days, right? The they are. To drive. They are, Jim. Well, a, a good point about going to the grocery store is that's when I've seen some of our seniors get their exercise. So if you get to see a senior pushing a cart, I mean, it's not like a walker, but it has advantages. And I am also concerned about seniors getting their purse stolen or their bill folded. They, they have, cause they will, you know, 
or too trusting a lot of us are. So this has upsides and downsides, but um, yes, it's, it's such a great service for us to be able to have seniors get the, and others with needs get their groceries delivered. I'm mm -hmm. um, with Jayla, you know, there has to be money for it somewhere for this to happen. So I'll, yeah. uh, thank you. That's a good point, Jim. And, you know, in the rural areas, there's no option for Walmart to come and deliver your groceries. That just doesn't happen in the rural areas. So anyways, back to you, Jayla. Yeah, you know, that's pretty much all, all, all I wanted to talk about. I could go on forever and ever. Uh, please take a look at our uh, at our uh, activity report. There's a lot of information in there. I know it's long, but the reason we did it is so that we wouldn't have to do um, reports and you could stay up to date with what's going on with all the activities in the office, right? Um, but there is some good information and you get some good a, a good idea of what's going on. Are there any questions of me? I have a question. It's yeah, Barbara. Barbara. Uh -huh. You know, we talked about really getting more involved in advocacy. Is is there something that all of us can do and bring to our communities? Yep, uh, maybe we're, not and, right now, but later on that. Yeah, you Barbara, we're working on that us. now. So we're okay. gonna use some of the pieces that we took um to DC to distribute out to you all, change it up a little bit, make it more state focused. Um, we have already started some advocacy efforts. Bob's been involved. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is just create awareness. So we have kind of an awareness campaign uh, that we're working on. We don't have a lot of money, like we can't hire a consultant to do this. So we're pulling in people that we know, um, like Murphy Houston from No Copay Radio and other folks like that. We're hoping that um, some other media people will help us. Um, some folks from the business community, you know, very much like what I did with the Veterans Directive Program when we were trying to get the Veterans Directive Program, I just asked for volunteers to help me because when I was an ombudsman, I was on the Veterans Committee for the governor. I asked some of those people to come. I asked some businessmen to come. We had like three meetings and guess what? The next time we applied for Veterans Directive, we got it because um, we got that language. So. Part of um, the, the advocacy program is creating awareness and then getting materials together, getting our contractors together, getting you all together and coming up really having a consolidated message. I'm already starting to meet with some of our executive directors of like I met with uh, David uh, uh, Shrunk um, from Volunteers of America last week. Uh, talking with him about the importance of advocating together and for for people to, for them to let people know that we're their number one funder when it comes to nutrition programs right and that they need to say that so that when legislators are making decisions they understand that a good portion of that money is going to go to nutrition programs like volunteers of america so those are those are um meetings that we're having and we will have a larger effort. Um, Rich and I are already working on it. Rich is uh, setting up a meeting with the governor's office. We're hoping to get increased funding for uh, AAA programs into the governor's budget. We have support in with uh, Jared Hughes and we have support with um, some some of the other staff and I uh, but I am not sure if the governor will actually put it in his budget so we have a backup plan um, and are already identifying uh, legislators that we could run a bill with um, and of course then we're also having to work with all the other triple A's in the state because it's not just they can't fund just Dr. Cog they're going to fund all the triple A's in the in the state. So that's important as well. And, you know, Jayla and Barbara too, I think timing is really um, right to go um, after some kind of funds for social isolation. The Surgeon General just um, proclaimed social isolation an, an epidemic in our country. I don't know if you guys have that paper that was sent out. It's 
wonderfully done. There's a lot of great information coming out of the Surgeon General's office. And I learned something new uh, that chronic isolation in older adults can increase your chances of getting dementia by 50%, 50 percent, five zero percent. I knew a lot of the other stats about it's like smoking 15 cigarettes a day, six alcoholic, alcoholic beverages a day, but that dementia component that was something new for that me. That is scary stuff, man. That is it is so stuff. scary. And I believe with the attention on it nationally, the fact that the Surgeon General um, declared it an epidemic, timing could be right for us to look at funding for, for isolation. Bob, thanks so much for sending it to us and Mindy will get it out to everybody. I'm certainly going to use that in our federal advocacy. Um, and maybe there's some kind of, I mean, maybe there's another approach just like we're doing at the federal level of looking uh, on ways to attach to other bills for specific kinds of services, right? Instead of just all the older Americans Act programs. Um, we're learning more about um, Ron and I in Washington also had a, a, a pretty interesting meeting um, uh, with AMPO, and, uh, and I'm forgetting what AMPO stands for, um, but it's transportation yeah, well. right, and planning. And uh, we were talking about how we use, we match AAA dollars with federal highway dollars to expand the pot of money uh, to, for, for transportation services for older adults and people with disabilities. And she was very impressed with that and talked about maybe other opportunities uh, for those kinds of partnerships um, in different, even like with vehicles, right? So we use 5310 to um, funding, which is uh, highway fund or transportation funding to then um, buy vehicles for our, our providers. Um, there may be even more that we could do, which is pretty exciting. Um, and it's looking, I think that's how we're going to have to do. I also said to them, please, 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 if you see any kind of bills that are coming down related to partnerships between healthcare and community based services, please take a really hard look at those. You may see that there's payment for referrals, and I did my whole referral, don't. Um, don't change health outcomes, services change health outcomes. Please, please make sure that there's money for the service because that's the thing that's so important. And um, there, we also have new federal lobbyists. Thorn Run is our new federal lobbyist firm and they are fantastic. They have designated aging specialists, which is fantastic. And they are, so they kept on saying to me, Jayla, this is about follow-up. This is about relationship building. This is about giving information. This is about being responsive when they ask you. And already <laughs> I have an email uh, with five things that I have to do for our lobbyists because they are really pushing us to, to develop these relationships. Um, but as with any developing relationships, it takes time and effort. And so that's what you just have to put into it. Okay, now I'm done. Jayla? I, keep I think <laughs> Phil, Phil, go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. So, Jayla, uh, during uh, and everyone, uh, during this uh, break in the state legislative session, as well as with our federal legislators, looking for opportunities to meet them when they're in our communities yeah. and having groups or in groups don't mean to be large it could be three folks that will meet with them at their offices with all of the data because it's not the plethora of data that's important it's the face-to-face -face with the legislators to let them know these are these are dire situations that we're talking about. And when we get the referrals, you're absolutely right. Uh, referrals without dollars for services doesn't make sense. It's not going to get the job done. But getting face to face with the state legislators as well as the federal legislators and getting on their mailing list so we know 
when they're having their town hall meetings and being able to be in front of them, uh, prepared with the information, but getting that face-to-face so that they know that it's real people we're talking about, not just the yeah, no, that's very important. We're also talking about doing some site visits with some of our contractors. And, you know, Chris, you are always one of my favorite places to take people because you actually have older adults in your shop um, and you can, they can see all their adults being served. So, um, And we're always happy to have yeah. any group like that. Always welcome that. So um, those, I think those are, those are really important and it's just prioritizing that stuff and getting it done, right? You can just, it, it's got to be a primary focus for me. And I'm so lucky because I have such awesome managers of our programs. I can really step up and do more of this right now because they are keeping the, the ship of the, of the AAA running, not only good, Excellent, excellently. I mean, I have got the best group of managers and program manager staff that I've ever had. I mean, they are just freaking amazing and really talented. So, um, you know, I feel like I could, I always say if I get hit by a bus or, or win the lottery, we'll be fine in the AAA because they're really good. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Jayla, for always, you know, being the the voice of the older adults and fighting for these funds. And I know it's not easy. I know you've been doing it for a lot of years, but you do it so well. And we're really so appreciative to have you as our, our leader in this and anything we can do. And I know I speak for everybody in this group. You just let us know we're there. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. And guess what? It was my birthday when we made most of the Hill visits. And so every legislator said happy birthday to me. My oh. most birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. It was fun. And the guys took me out for dinner. So very nice. Very <laughs> nice. Um, well, we can move on, I think, to the consent agenda approving the minutes are there any any comments before we go on to approve the minutes any okay. corrections no okay can we get a motion i'll move barbara to approve second win any opposed so moved great okay um we've got discussion oh that's me i'm on action item <laughs> um we traditionally take july and december off from meetings it seems like during those two months people are traveling families coming in um it just is such a busy time but we always like to make sure everybody is in agreement of that. Is there anyone that that would not like to take July off or have a compelling reason why we shouldn't take July off? Okay, it looks like we are taking July break and I hope everybody, I hope it's sunny and not wet. Carrie, we should probably do a motion in a second. Okay. I'll move it. Second. Who was the second? Tom? Tom Mahold. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Anyone opposed to taking July off? No. So we're going to be out having barbecues and not being rained on, I hope, in July. Uh, <laughs> question on December, on the December one, when does the legislature reopen and do we typically have to do anything before the legislature starts? Good question. Jayla? Uh, that is a good question. Typically, Rich will give us like an update of where we're at. You know, that was that first uh, in January. Um, 
But this year might be different in the sense that, I mean, I w- we'll still take it off, I think, Tom, because it's so close to the holidays, right? Sure. People just won't show up. But mm-hmm. if we need to take some kind of special action, we might call for an earlier meeting in, in, um, in December. I don't think we will. I think you'll be briefed every month about where we're at, what we're doing. Um, we'll make sure that you review materials. I mean, what's so wonderful about having you all um, board members on, on this committee is that y- you were, uh, you are and were elected officials and you know, I think you have a different perspective and I think your insight on our materials uh, will be helpful. Um, you know, I always feel bad when I, when we take a packet of information, because it's like they are not going to read a packet of information. Um, but if I have a one pager with some pretty easily definable, you know, quick information kind of stuff, um, and I think that our one pager that we took to DC was successful um, because people looked at it and we had asks, you know, um, clearly spelled out. So. Hopefully that's uh, um, something that you will all have already seen by December. Cool. Um, Carrie, while we're on the subject, um, since we've moved to the fourth Friday of the month in November, of course, that Friday happens the day after Thanksgiving. I don't know whether we want to have a discussion of moving that to maybe the third Friday for just the month of November. Um, I don't know how everybody feels about that, but um, it's something to think about. Well, I think that's a really good idea. And um, maybe we could just plan on doing that unless someone is opposed to it, because I would, I don't want to miss November and December. Yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. So or uh, we do the first Friday in December or something like that. Yeah, either one would be fine with me. So shall we why, why don't we why don't we uh study that a minute because December is coming not coming up quickly. Yeah, we we can we can decide that maybe come October or even September, but thanks for throwing that out there Mindy. Okay. okay. Some of us want to make sure we're here in December. <laughs> We're well, that's on terrible it. that's terrible huh i should damn <laughs> oh well, i'm feeling healthy all right okay yes all right um we've got uh kelly is on going to tell us about the survey results yep uh yeah as you all know we have a a work group a subgroup of the aca Uh, folks who are going through the uh, ACA bylaws and revising and looking to make recommendations about them. And we decided that in the process of doing that, it would be a good, perfect timing to ask the current ACA members to give us some input about their involvement with the ACA. So we sent out a survey and we, Mindy's bringing up the compilation of the survey that I did from all the uh, survey responses. So of the 20 ACA members who received the survey, 14 of you submitted your responses. And then you can see the breakout of how many years those folks have served on the ACA. So we have a bunch of newbies because there are six of you less than one year, four, six to 20, no, that's probably six to 10 years. And then 11 to 15, two, and more than 15 years, two of you who responded. So if you'll scroll down, Mindy. We asked folks to share with us um, how how many organizations they interact with and they listed those out. And I was pretty impressed that, you know, 10 of you said that you absolutely do interface with other organizations. 
And the total of all of those organizations was 30. So that was, that's important to know that you all are very connected. So then we asked, how does your organization benefit from you serving on the ACA? And you can see the answers here, um, getting information on aging issues, um, being able to bring that information or bring information from the community and your counties to the ACA, aligning community and county organization goals with, the, with AAA, being a collective voice for the eight counties in the Denver region and learning about the success and challenges of other programs in the region. So the, those clearly indicate, you know, there's value to all these organizations that you are aligned with. So then as far as how you benefit personally, Similarly, learning and being informed about issues, services, and resources. Several people said that they feel like the information they get means they're able to actively assist seniors, individuals in their communities. The opportunity to advocate and influence policies, receiving and sharing vital information, being a voice for change, and helping to make the world a better place. Again, clearly there's value. So what are, you, what are your primary interests? If you could back that up a little bit, Min, thanks. Helping people age in place, funding for services, helping with that effort, getting information and resources to be able to make referrals, connecting people and organizations, helping the generations that are facing the challenges of assisting their aging relatives. And, and by the way, we're seeing more and more um, impact on millennials these days as far as caregiving. Access to information and assistance, legislation and advocacy, supporting the AAA, and then topics specific to affordable housing, transportation, ageism, and intergenerational experiences and opportunities. So with the remaining part of the survey, I'm going to be asking you some questions. I'd like to get even kind of dig deeper into some of this. So. We asked you to share your expertise that you bring to the ACA. And you're gonna see this is a very extensive list. Uh, Medicare insurance broker, understanding the rural and suburban challenges in Arapahoe County, former elected official, master of arts degree in gerontology, 35 plus years as a professional in long-term care, decades experience with nonprofits. And then this one under leadership role, we have, you all have a lot of leadership experience with the county councils on aging, aging nonprofits, churches, certificate and gerontology leadership, a SHIP program director, and someone who supervised health insurance investigators. Uh, eclectic background in small to large businesses, affordable housing, senior design and development, bylaws and policies, community and outreach, brainstorming, volunteer management, collaboration, a master's in public policy, CEO and founder of a nonprofit resource center, transportation, and last, but definitely not least, I'm a senior myself. So at this point, I'd like to pause and ask the question, how can the ACA take more advantage of this wealth of expertise? Do you want to have full screen again, Kelly? 
Uh, sure, you're fast at this. So again, we have a lot of expertise on this uh, ACA advisory group. Is there more that we can be doing to tap your expertise? Well, we've talked about advocacy and assisting in advocacy, and I know that's something we're working on right now, um, but boy, we, it, we have a lot of talented people in this group, and I think, I think we could tap into that more than we have in the past. Well, I think the, the, it, would, it would be helpful if we had some direction about which which um, legislative activities would be the most useful uh, for the the upcoming session uh, and, and and as we all uh, most of us know you know there's a lot of legislative activity that help that happens in the off season you know which is going on you know right now <clears throat> in terms of um, uh, shaping uh, what could be bills in the next session and finding, you know, sponsors for those bills and all, all that good stuff that Rich is very familiar with. Um, but I think that if we had some kind of um, sub subject matter direction, then people could look at that and say, well, this is a subject that, that's really important to me and I would like to get more involved in it. You know, I, I, so I just throw that out there. What, what do you all think about it? I really like having that, Jayla, you were talking about you brought a one sheet to DC because you're right, people are not going to read through 24 pages. And I think as we get further along with different advocacies or as Bob said, upcoming bills or opportunities, it, that one sheet direction, and I know you're already working on this is really beneficial for us as a group to have yeah. so that we can present ourselves as subject matters on what is important right now, right. not something that is going to happen in four years. Right. I think, I think that what that also shows me, um, the expertise is that, uh, that we as a AAA could use this expertise expertise periodically kind of like we're using this the subgroup right now um bob you know like the media that there are people out there that maybe we could pull and and have a little uh group for a couple of meetings and get feedback on different topics that the area agency on aging may be dealing with right especially as we spend expand into business partnerships we have <laughs> we go up and down and up and down with our hospital partners and um, our insurance partners, and it's been uh, a learning experience for sure. But there is, there, there you know, might be something that we could learn in a different way. Um, also, you know, one of the things, and this is later on, it won't happen much next year because we're going to focus really hard on the state legislation, but helping our local governments understand what the AAA does, how they can be of value to the to um, the local governments, the local governments then value the triple A's and take it to their legislators that helps as well. And so I think those are all things that, yeah, Jim, you. Well, as a former city councilor, I, I, I couldn't echo that enough, Jayla. I think you, you know, I think that we need to try almost be on the agenda of the Metro Mayor's Conference. I think that we need to be able to have a, uh, a strong input to our city councils because you know all cities have uh, budget challenges, but there might be some matching that can go on. I mean, when it gets to Jefferson County and after our, our uh, either Don or Carrie's done, I wanted to talk about some Jefferson County issues, but I think where it's Golden or Lakewood or Aurora or whatever, the council should be really aware of this wonderful organization, and some are. Not having a clue about all the services and the challenges faced by the seniors. So, number one, uh, more communications with Metro mayors, and so that they can 
communicate. And of course, you'd think we'd, they'd be getting that through Dr. Cog and the wonderful briefings you give there, Jayla, but sometimes it's not getting down to the council level. Yeah, so, I think I think you're right. I think going to council because council deals with the the citizenry right there, right? Um, and those issues that you're you're dealing with, and I think council um, is an important partner. Um, and then then may also can see opportunities. You know, you hear from your own human services and uh, people, uh, and you know what issues are. And oh, you know, maybe. Maybe Jefferson County is working on that. So are we, how can we partner? Those are, those are uh, great, great suggestions. Bill has got his hand up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Jayla and team, um, as Jim has mentioned, taking a look at partnerships, uh, there's a couple, you know, when we're dealing with state issues, that um, is good to consider. One is, if a similar survey is taken of the advisory committees for the other AAAs within the state, so that we're not just perceived as a Denver um, whining group, uh, but is uh, uh, in partnership with the other AAAs, that would be a wonderful thing to include. And as you're looking at expertise on issues, um, I would say that there's probably some other expertise or reinforcing expertise among the other AAAs. Uh, secondly, when we're looking for partnerships, uh, we can get the municipal side uh, and the Colorado Municipal League might be another place to go in addition to the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Um, but we should understand civics in Colorado that uh, the folks that are on the front line in at least some of these issues along with us is the counties where social services are provided through the counties. Um, the uh, municipal side can help us in whining about it, uh, but the counties are the ones that are charged with also executing and are also looking for funding uh, on some side. Um, I don't know what HH is going to do in the fall. Uh, I have to say I have issues both pro and con on HH that's looking at funding for counties. But if the counties aren't stepping up and saying a good portion of the windfall is going to be used in providing for senior services going forward, uh, I'll be very disappointed. And if they don't, uh, silence means no. So. Um, but I would look at uh, CCI and the counties. And uh, as the AAA also is touched by the counties, I think that would be a great way to have, uh, what is it called, uh, C4A? Is that the, the way yeah, that it's- Yeah, that's it, yeah. Jayla, and would look for them to partner on this. So we aren't the only ones that are taking data to the legislators. Uh, being no, uh, no, you're absolutely right. We we are doing that, and Rich is already Rich meets with CCA every quarter, um, uh, so that we because we can't just go talking about Dr. Cog issues. Um, the state can't just fund Dr. Cog; it has to be a statewide uh, approach. Um, but uh, Doug, do you have any feedback on on what was said about CCI or Metro Mayor's Caucus? Morning, everyone. No, I really don't. I just think it's a great idea that we sh we should. Um, yeah, I think sometimes we we forget that um, just because we have those conversations at the Dr. Cog board doesn't doesn't mean that that information is uh, is always being shared with the rest of the council and commission. So I think any opportunity for us to get out in front of our locally elected officials um, would be great because they could help us at legis at the legislature. And Rich would help us get that set up, Doug? Um, sure. Okay, thanks. Okay, Kelly. Yeah, I, may I? Uh, this, is, um, this is a new thought, or at least presentation, of a role for the council. 
um, up until now, we have been primarily uh, expected and happily provide information given to us. But the idea of using the value of the people who are members and having a process in which such can be used would be a, a in my opinion, a very helpful and important opportunity for, for the council and for the rest of the uh, operation. Yeah, it's even more important to um, understand our resources, right, uh, than ever. We don't have a big budget. We're not going to have a lot of money. We're going to be dealing with funding cuts. We've got to look at all of our resources as effectively as we can. And I think, you know, coming out of COVID, we, uh, we're, we're, you know, there's still challenges from COVID, still putting programs back together, but it's, it's pretty stable now overall. Um, and, and, and now is the time to, to advocate because, you know, funding's going away and we need to get, <laughs> we need to get a different kind of funding source to make sure that we can still keep up with the demand. All of that ARPA money is going away. The homestead money is going away. Um, so we have got to figure out a new way to get more funding into the system uh, so that we can continue to provide services and that we can, um, uh, that we don't have to take away services from people who are already getting them. Uh, that's, that is the big charge right now. Um, all right, go ahead. Um, I, I'm sorry, Kelly. No, keep on talking this, forever. This this is great input, and and it really validates some of the thing, some of the discussions that the work group has had about when it comes to revising the uh, ACA bylaws, because there's quite a, a long list of uh, descriptions or responsibilities. And we've had some good, lively conversations similar to this one in which we're looking at ways to give um, members of the ACA more involved, more active roles. Um, and advocacy definitely heads the list of that. So I'm delighted to hear that there is um, interest in doing this. And I think you're gonna hear more from us about this. And, and it also aligns with the needs that we have as we build this big public awareness campaign. Jayla and Rich can't do it by themselves anymore. It's too big an animal. And I, I, I think also as we not only look at what we need to do with the legislators, I think uh, what several of you have said is there's a lot of opportunity to build some awareness and uh, relationships and partnerships with the business community. So uh, I think it's great that we might have some of you that we can tap to help us do that. So to get so to the Kelly final... Rich, Rich just wanted everybody to know that he will help and he's already working on some of this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Mindy, if you'd pull up the, the report again, we'll go over the last section in which we asked the question, what would you like to see the ACA do differently? So these were the quintessential elements that people shared and I'll, I'll run through them and then we'll figure out how we're going to address this. So, uh, a, co a comment about having shorter ACA meetings, um, more meetings in person, doing another and or doing annual retreats like we did uh, last October, streamlining the process for uh, bringing new members on board to the ACA, uh, provider reports with handouts on services especially in underserved communities, and similarly, more presentations by external experts. Are there any more of those, Mindy? Ah, more participation from senior commissions, outreach to community organizations, such as Rotary and the Optimus, 
Uh, this will be familiar with what we just talked about, focus more on uniting groups for advocacy and educating elected officials, be more involved with supporting AAA efforts, supporting the staff, perhaps more subcommittees uh, that are um, involved with specific functions for the ACA members to serve on. And then this one, Doug, you'll be interested in this one, um, information from Dr. Cog board members on how the AAA works within Dr. Cog's structure and how the ACA can be helpful to the Dr. Cog board. So I think let's just go to a quick opportunity for you all to weigh in on any of those responses. I remember when the meetings were three hours, so I thought we were doing really well with two hours. <laughs> yeah, they used to go from 11 to three. Yeah, it, yeah, they used to be quite long. Um, how do people feel about meeting in person? I think that's an interesting, it's funny, it's an interesting idea now that we've been meeting virtually for several years. How do others feel about that? I know we got some comments that the new location is is difficult to get in and out of, um, but I don't know if that's still true. Any comments? Yeah, I think we could meet somewhere besides downtown. I mean, was there a problem with that? Do it somewhere else? There's, My there's only not a problem with that. Um, I, I, we had talked about meeting maybe a couple of times a year in person, right? Um, downtown would be difficult now because our parking agreement has changed with the building. Um, mm -hmm. So remember, you used to have free parking and now, um, so we would have to get that reinstated. It is, it, 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 it is um, Ella. challenging, yeah. Go Parking ahead. wouldn't be an issue. We have we could validate. Okay. Okay. Um, I just have a couple comments of if you did it somewhere else other than Dr. Cog, doing it as a virtual and you know like a hybrid um, would be more difficult. We seem to get more people showing up when we're doing it virtual, and there's also um, before we used to provide lunch if you came in. And so when we're talking about funding, there's the added cost to that. I'll just put those out there. Okay. May I, um, gosh, to me, the, the first question is, is it more valuable for us to meet in person? Not where and all of that. And uh, from my perspective, it's a very different meeting that we have or have had when we were in person. Uh, a lot of the dynamics that can occur there and recognition by one or two people of interest of others in the same issue can come across. When it's uh, virtual, much of that is lost, in my opinion. Okay. Anyone else have any comments about this, Jim? I I'm, I really would like to see periodic meetings in person. I I found that on council, since I, when I was on council, we were doing virtual, I knew everybody. But I mean, I'm trying to remember if I've ever met you in person, Kate. And, and I, I never met Tex in person. I, I can't I can't uh, ex uh, express more strongly how important it is on getting meet people face to face mm -hmm. and establishing relationships. Now we don't have to do it all the time, but boy, if we have six new people who've never met, I mean, I don't think I've ever met Phil, I, uh, uh, you know, or Bob, or it, 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 you know, it just would mean so much to me to be able to function more highly, I think, or do a better job. If I 
could see somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, that's enough said. It just I just feel strongly about periodic physical meetings. Those are really good points. I I wonder. I don't know what that next step would be, Kelly, but it's great input, I think, as you're compiling all of this. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I think this is a perfect uh, subject matter for the work group to take a look at and and uh, with Jayla and, and see about the logistics. I was delighted to see, Sherry, that you said there might be an opportunity to meet at a Kaiser Permanente uh, office location. So, you know, if we had the opportunity for some nice meeting spaces in our region that we don't have to pay for, <laughs> um, I think that's uh, definitely an, uh, something to think about. I'd like to ask Gretchen um, if, if you wouldn't mind, Gretchen, because I know Douglas County Senior Council had met virtually for a long time and you recently changed that. Would you weigh in a little bit? Sure. Um, we did about, it will be two years this fall, a community outreach survey. And one of the questions was uh, addressing, you know, how do you like to meet? And there were choices. There was in-person, there was virtual, there was, I'd like to have an option. And uh, most of the people mentioned in-person which was what we were doing exclusively before COVID. Uh, a few men mentioned virtually, and um, I thought there was a significant number of people that said they'd like to have an option. So for instance, if we're gonna meet at the Parker Library, which we're going to do you know, next month, and I plan to attend in person, but suddenly that particular day, I'm not feeling very well, but I want to get the information, I have that virtual option. So in order to meet all of those uh, requirements, what we decided to do was have each quarter one kind of a hybrid meeting that was mentioned earlier before. And so we have that meeting at the Philip S. Miller building because they have the capability of having us there not only in person, but to have virtual attendees. So once a quarter, we have that for people who would prefer virtual, um, or would prefer an option for that particular day. So that's four times a year. And then the other two times a quarter, we're in person in various locations because as you know, we don't have a brick and mortar or you know, uh, office for ourselves. And, and so there's a wide variety of answers depending on a person's circumstance. And we have always been very concerned about those folks who are homebound for whatever reason, whether it's by choice or whether it's necessity because they can't drive or they have mobility issues. And so at least having one virtual meeting a quarter, we feel addresses some of those people who have computer capabilities. And that's what we found and it seems to be working well. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. Just more information for Kelly and her group. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, thank you all for that input. We will definitely be taking a look at that. And um, uh, Kelly, Kelly. Yeah. Can I? Before we yeah. move off topic, um, how would you all feel about just scheduling an in-person meeting at a location to be determined? or let's just pick a month, you know, September. What do, you, what do you think about that? I think, it, no, oh, yeah. I think it sounds good, Bob. I mean, I my thought was is that maybe Kelly and the group were going to take all of this and let's see, we won't be meeting then till August um maybe by by the august meeting we can we can have a a discussion on on the september meeting or if you'd okay. like to do it another way i'm open to that too well, why don't we just what, why don't we deal with the way bob asked the question have just one meeting in september that gives uh, Kelly some time and our committee some time to, to work on alternatives, but at least it sets 
sets a precedent. Wynn just put in uh, the chat that RTD is free in July and August. So, you know, we could do the August meeting. Um, we just have to find a place to do that. Would we not be able to do it at Dr. Cog? I'll have to see if the room is available because we have given up the space since we didn't use it all the time. So I can check into that. Okay. All right, sounds like more to come. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just offer a piece of information here, Carrie, in that we've recently um, have had a meeting at the Canvas headquarters in Lone Tree. They have a very nice, large community room, which was free. And the fellow we spoke to over there, I believe his name is Josh, mentioned to us that they are perfectly willing to host other organizations' uh, meetings there free of charge. Oh, that's great. Can you uh, maybe email um, that contact info to Mindy? Sure. Well, and that goes back to Bob's suggestion of potentially looking at other options if Dr. Cog conference space isn't available. Did mm -hmm. they have um, AD and, and capabilities there? Um, I, we'd have to ask, we didn't, we didn't need it for our particular meeting. So, you know, okay. I, I don't recall if that was any available, um, but I'm sure this fellow could answer any questions that Mindy might have about that. Thank you. Sure. One of the things we're also gonna to have to check on is insurance. I don't know, but I'm gonna run it by Jenny Dock on our um, uh, in ANF uh, who, just to make sure that we may, we may need to buy some kind of insurance coverage to make sure that I don't know. We, when we have an offsite meeting, I always ask Denny Doc. So, <laughs> okay. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts, but people are very interested in meeting in person. So, if we could, you know, do some work on the back end and and see, is the conference room open? Do we look at another site? Um, it sounds like people really do want to meet in person, Jim. Yeah. Not to compound this, but I would like for the committee to consider this could even be an expanded meeting that would give us kind of an annual uh, summit flavor if we did a half day or went from 11 to 4. And then Jayla could re-educate us and staff could re-educate us about many things. And then the people who have been around for a while could make comments on those uh, old programs, new programs, et cetera. I, if we're going to do it, I think that might be helpful because we're there in place. So not to make things complex, but something to add. Uh, so the group and Kelly, by the way, great job. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was one of the recommendations, right? Have an annual summit. Um, and then I think it's different, maybe having um, meetings in person. Um, and I would like to look at it. Well, we can certainly talk about this later, but we will definitely look at, for one in in August or September, um, uh, an in-person meeting, and then um, talk with the committee about this and see uh, what, what you know, just kind of brainstorm it a little bit more, understand what the requirements are for offsite, onsite, all those kinds of things. Okay. I think that does it. I mean, the only other thing here that I mentioned was the notion of, of uh, the, the response about uh, having more information about how uh, the AAA works within Dr. Cog's structure and how that relationship between the AAA and the Dr. Cog board could be enhanced. That would, that seems like something that we could talk about and Doug and I could talk about and maybe um, the board represent board representatives here as well. That would definitely be something that we could talk about at like an annual retreat, right? Every single year, just reminding people the connection and, and how we work together. Um, okay. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I think that 
having more involvement from such a rich <laughs> wealth of people with expertise bodes well for the for the AAA and the ACA. Thank you, Kelly. That was, I know, a lot of work to gather all of the information and put it together, but it's good stuff. And I think it'll make us stronger as a, as a board. Okay. All right, we've got our next item is the AAA funding process. And that was gonna be Jayla and Sharon. Sharon, do I? Yes, see? I am here. Hi, <laughs> um, Hi I, everyone. I, yeah, I, I just want to say, you know, this is in a, a response to a request that you had of us uh, to just remind you all about the complexities of the AAA funding process. So some of it may be review, some may be brand new, um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's important to understand that there are so many pieces of the of the funding process and how we make decisions. So that's what Sharon's here to tell you about. Thanks, Jayla. Um, so uh, in in the previous meeting, um, uh, also hi everyone. Good to good to see you all. Um, and for those that aren't uh, don't know me, I am the um, manager of the AAA business operations side. So I oversee um, AAA funding, um, the contractor group, um, compliance and, and all of that. So uh, in response to questions from the May meeting uh, during which the ACA approved the, um, or uh, the recommendations for our fiscal year 2024 contractor group. Um, th there were some questions about, you know, how, what does our funding process look like as far as selection of contractors, as well as the amounts that are allocated to them. And so I've got a, um, a presentation. Um, hopefully, Mindy, I can share my screen and you can all hear me clearly enough. Hey, hold on just a second. Let me um, make you a, a co-host so we can do that. Okie dokie. Are we good? Did it tell you yes? Uh, like I'm here? I did not. I will try though to yeah. see. It says on my screen you are, but. Okay. Okay. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen. Can. Um, you can? Okay, great. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's get into slideshow view. Um, so I thought I would um, start off by talking about the how we procure the services. So uh, in the fall, uh, we released a request for proposal solicitation um, for Older Americans Act services. Um, we had also uh, concurrently released a transportation super call which combined the funding from the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310, as well as the state uh, human set aside, uh, human services set aside uh, funds, which is all for transportation. Um, we did a, um, a concurrent transportation call for, uh, for projects um, last fall. That RFP closed in November. And the thing I just wanted to mention here about that RFP is that we did a little bit differently starting this year and that we split the services. So uh, rather than having everything all um, collected at one point for evaluation, we actually solicited for half of the eligible services. Um, and then for the other half, uh, we allowed our existing contractors to submit uh, budget proposals for next year um, that essentially uh, would um, allow them to ask for more funds if they wanted to, but it would had to be within the current scope of what they were already contracted. So um, in total, we collected uh, or, or uh, approximately $16.5 million were allocated from those um, 
from that RFP as well as from that contract amendment process. And um, the criteria that is used to uh, determine um, how those proposals um, are, are or would be evaluated, all of that is published within the required reading of our RFP solicitation. And so there's uh, five general criteria points for the proposals that are listed here. Um, I think many of you have, have um, are familiar with these. Obviously, the need for the service, looking at experience, performance, and capability of the agency, cost information, service outcomes, and basically the overall quality of the, the proposal. Um, the contract amendments are similarly evalu uh, are evaluated similar to the RFP process, but obviously since the end, you know, these were based on proposals that were uh, previously um, approved, really the focus is on the budget that was submitted, um, looking at any changes in costs, um, how many clients are being served, how many units provided, um, explanation for any uh, material uh, variances from what they're currently contracted, and looking at contract performance, just seeing as far as um, the contractor's possibility to do what they said that they would do in their proposals and spend the funds that they've requested. So those are sort of the general criteria. Um, the funding subcommittee uh, will score proposals and use those average scores to essentially decide uh, yay or nay on which um, proposal, service proposals uh, that they would recommend for funding. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, about that? I know that's fairly high level, but obviously there's a lot of factors that go into determining, you know, which, you know, who is um, recommended for funding. And I can't see the chat necessarily. So Mindy, you'll have to let me know. Um, I did also want to mention just um, to keep moving forward since I, um, I'm trying to keep us on time. We do also uh, fund for-profit providers. Um, it's a fee-for-service type of um, uh, contract. Uh, we um, largely uh, pay fee-for-service for our voucher program. So that is the choice services program for transportation and in-home care services. So we um, essentially have a, a contract to do business. There's no guarantee of any minimum number of, of clients or maximum that we would um, commit to sending, but the provider agrees to uh, provide the service at a rate that we negotiate. Uh, our Dr. Cog staff are the ones who do the intake and are responsible for um, reporting the services uh, to the state. Um, and so we have approximately two and a half million dollars committed to those fee for service providers. So again, those are our transportation and in home care uh, provide voucher providers, and it also includes Nimble Science, which is uh, the uh, the mobile fall prevention at, um, program, um, paying for the um, annual subscriptions to use those apps. That app, rather. So the funding subcommittee obviously decides, uh, makes recommendations about um, who to fund or who, who we would like to fund, but we are also, um, you know, constrained by the Older Americans Act funding parts. Uh, so our contract with the state uh, comes in federal and state money. The Older Americans Act piece is divided into uh, these various categories. Um, so for instance, um, our total funding will be broken out by these parts B, C, D, and E. Um, you might have heard us talk about before. And so within each of those funding subparts is there's a scope of what we can fund. Um, using those dollars. So in the case of Part B, it can pay for access assistance, such as transportation, 
um, information assistance and outreach, as well as case management. It also um, funds in-home services, adult day and legal assistance. And uh, part C is further subdivided by part, um, congregate meals and home delivered meals. So again, we have a set amount of money for each of these subparts um, that we can spend for each of these um, uh, categories. Um, within parts B, C1, and C2, without getting too much into the weeds, there are restrictions. We, are, we do have some uh, flexibility to be able to move funds within those parts, but we do have um, limits on what can be transferred between those parts. Uh, part D uh, is for evidence-based uh, healthy aging type programs. Uh, the Nas National Council on Aging provides a list of all of uh, their vetted programs that would be deemed evidence-based and that can be funded with these Part D dollars. Um, Part E is for the National Family Caregiver Support Program, so that uh, pays for caregiver um, counseling, training, education and support groups, as well as the grand, uh, the kinship caregiver program, which is the grandparents raising grandchildren. Um, the Part E has a higher match, it's 25%, whereas the other ones have a 10% match. Um, and uh, it has been a little bit harder to spend those dollars. We are not allowed to um, transfer uh, that money into a different category. And so and it does have come with a higher match. And on top of that, we've lost a couple of our um, key providers. And so uh, we are going to be launching a caregiver support program in fiscal year 2024. Um, you'll probably hear more about that um, in the future. Um, but again, Part E is a little bit harder to spend because of, um, you know, it, it is hard to, to find caregiver, uh, community-based caregiver support programs. Um, Title VII is a, uh, of the Older Americans Act funds, the ombudsman program. It's typically just a fraction of what it actually costs to be able to provide um, adequate ombudsman coverage for the number of facilities in our region. So the ombudsman program is also funded with the Part D, uh, rather Part B dollars. Um, so this is important to mention these these service prescriptions of Older Americans Act because while we get a whole variety of services, we all we have to try to fit them in within these buckets um, for the Older Americans Act portion, which often is usually. Um, around half of, of the total funding. It kind of varies year to year, but it's historically averaged about half of the total pot of money. Um, the state portion of what is available for services, which um, we refer to as the state funding for senior services, as well as the state Homestead Act dollars, uh, those uh, do not uh, have su subparts. So uh, we can essentially allocate those to any Older Americans Act eligible service. So uh, we have flexibility with those dollars and allocating those dollars. Um, however, we have to prioritize spending for the state dollars because unlike with the federal monies, um, any unspent dollars uh, by the end of the fiscal year is forfeited. And we never wanna forfeit any of our funds, um, obviously, as that has the potential to impact our, um, you know, our ability to, to um, our, our ability to, to get the same level of funding in the future if we don't spend it. Um, so since, there is no carryover provision for state dollars. We always prioritize, um, or we typically prioritize state uh, spending of those state dollars. Um, the federal dollars, there is um, some limited carryover that if the funds aren't spent, up to 10% can be carried over 
into the subsequent fiscal year. It's not a guarantee that we would necessarily get it. Um, however, um, it does at least al allow some breathing room in case um, funds do have to be returned. Um, the ARPA dollars that you've heard, that's American Rescue Plan Act, that's the last uh, piece of the COVID stimulus dollars that Dr. Cog has left available. And those dollars expire in September of 2024. Uh, the state homestead dollars, as you know, um, have heard from me, if you've um, heard any of my funding presentations in the past, those also expire in, um, this is the last, FY24 is the last year for the state homestead dollars. Um, but what I wanted to mention about the ARPA dollars is that it is also comes in parts, uh, in subparts B, C, D, and E. Um, however, because those were uh, issued to us during the federal emergency disaster declaration, we did um, and continue to um, have spending flexibility to be able to use services outside of their prescriptive funding parts. So for instance, the C dollars for nutrition could be used for part B transportation services. So that's the nice thing with the ARPA dollars. Um, so apart from uh, those specific funding rules, there are additional limits on the funding. As I mentioned before, there's those restrictions on transferring dollars between B and C. But there's also these minimum allocations for Part B. We have to have at least 25% of those access services, 15% um, to in-home services, and then a minimum of 3% to legal services. So as you're all talking about the advocacy that, um, you know, at the federal level, not only for just for additional funding, it's you know, it, it's certainly helpful or has been helpful to us to have the flexibility to spend the funds the way we need needed to within our region. Um, but these um, these limits are are back into effect now that the emergency disaster declaration has gone away. So we have to abide by these various limits. Um, but those are the essential funding rules, if you will. Uh, but then uh, as far as the funds distribution process um, included in the packet that you would have gotten for this meeting, I included the, the, fun, the, the written funds distribution process that the ACA had, uh, had approved. And so you'll look at sort of Kind of an, uh, an additional explanation of, of the other considerations that are made when it comes to allocating funds uh, for services. And obviously, you know, it's looking at that need for the service. It's looking at um, how that service fits in with for your plan, with the county priorities that inform the plan, uh, our, the AAA four-year plan, looking at uh, where we have wait lists where we have those gaps in service um, uh, within uh, geographically, as well as demo, uh, you know, uh, among the de different demographic groups, um, making sure that also that um, we are minimizing the amount of duplication um, among the services that we are able to fund within our region um, for when we have such limited dollars and, and we need to be able to spread that as broadly as possible. So it, it, there are a, a variety of things that we look at, um, but the funding subcommittee, um, they, they, they use that funds distribution process as sort of what guides their, um, their decision-making when they're determining how much money. So after they've decided who they want to fund, um, then it comes down to how much can we fund and where. And so in looking at the need for service in the region, obviously we will uh, refer to that hierarchy of needs um, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs model, where we always want to make sure that our funding allocation mix is reflective of, of, of this 
sort of hierarchy where we are really focusing on making sure we have a strong foundation for covering those basic need services. So the transportation, you know, people may need to be able to get where they need to go, they get the food that they need, they get uh, in-home care to be able to live independently at home. So making sure that we prioritize those basic need services and then going up from there, uh, the safety need services um, cover the material aid, the chore and home repair and so on, and going up the, um, the pyramid. And then um, apart from that, there are obviously a lot of other considerations. Again, going sort of back to the criteria from the RFP where we're looking at uh, providers' ability to provide that, you know, demonstrated ability to provide the service. How much does it cost to provide that service relative to other providers within who um, are providing a similar type of service? Um, looking at sort of historical performance and being able to, um, you know, uh, do complete uh, complete uh, the the scope of work. And also looking at what was originally requested and what was ultimately awarded and any other additional funds that may have uh, perhaps during mid-year were awarded to the contract. So it's really looking at a whole variety of factors when it comes down to determining how much to um, or how to allocate those funds among the various services. So I'll, I'll pause for a moment in case anybody has any questions about that. And certainly the funding subcommittee may wanna, could, you know, would be happy to, uh, to weigh in if, if needed. Sharon, there's a comment in the chat that isn't there a respite program under the Older Americans Act? Is there a respite program? There is under the Family Caregiver Support Program. Thank you. Sharon? Uh, yes. One of the things that you've talked about, and I know the funding committee is can probably weigh in as well. Um, you know, as you look at balancing between basic needs, safety needs, and psychological needs, what kind of rule of thumb is there, or does the acts themselves stipulate a allocation across what is going to be spent? in those various different categories. And with that, when you're looking at the effectiveness or cost per service or cost per benefit, um, you maybe you could talk a little bit more about the art that goes into that. Sure. Yes, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, so the... As far as the stratification of, of figuring out what, how much for basic needs, how much for safety, I mean, that really is more of a, an internal policy. There's nothing as far as older America, um, Americans Act that really uh, defines how much or what proportion of your funding uh, needs to go to each of those. Um, but we, you know, Obviously, we, we, we are mandated to provide, um, you know, services within each of those funding categories that I mentioned previously, um, but Dr. Cog, ACA, um, had come together um, some time ago. I, 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 this might have been, I, I don't know, it obviously was preceded me, but um, I think the the priority as far as making sure that we're make uh, you know we're optimizing the use of our funds by making sure that we are covering those basic needs is was a, is more sort of an, an internal um, uh, prioritization procedure. Um, oh. Would you say that's fair, Jayla? Yeah, this came about. Um... We were getting legal challenges uh, regarding our funding processes. People were questioning our funding processes. And so we formalized it more. Um, and it was lucky that we did because the following year, um, after we put this together, we ended up in court um, uh, uh, from a contractor that hadn't been funded and we had to defend our process. And, um, 
it was tedious and the funding subcommittee had to go in and testify and we had to turn over a lot of notes and all of our uh, uh, information. But one of the things that the judge said was, is that um, it was really good. We had a formal process that we had clear defined um, uh, uh, criteria for, for making decisions. There are some must do's in the Older Americans Act, like three, a minimum of 3% has to go to legal funding, right? Um, in the ombudsman program, for example, they don't tell you how much money you have to have, but they tell you that you have to visit nursing homes every month and assisted living every quarter and investigate complaints within a certain time frame, and that then drives your spending, right? Because when you have over 500 facilities in the metropolitan area, you have to figure out what that's going to be and what a reasonable caseload is. Um, and ours, I mean, I still don't think, I think ours is not reasonable with, uh, you know, still a lot of, a lot of facilities that ombudsmen have to visit, but um, those are some of the criteria. So sometimes it doesn't tell us an exact money amount, but it does tell us the things we must do, and then we have to fund accordingly. So if an un, uh, unfair follow-up. Uh, and Sharon, I'll leave this also open for Jayla and Doug if he wants to chime in. Uh, there are other organizations that are charged somewhat with overlapping objectives. For example, I sit on the HTP uh, Citizen Advisory Committee, and I've continued to question whether hospitals are the right place for community health benefits, when I look at a hospital as kind of a collision center that you don't go to the hospital unless everything is kind of falling apart. And I can, um, I see the value in reducing readmissions on the part of hospitals and being able to help with Medicare costs and such. But uh, having hospitals charged with general community health benefit um, seems to overlap. And um, at least what I've seen is there's nobody really looking at their effectiveness in being able to provide those benefits. I would uh, agree with you. I, <laughs> I, I think that's right. I think that they're, they're not looking at that. Um, and if you look at their cost compared to our cost for providing those benefits, it's significantly different. Ours is much lower because they always factor in a a profit margin for themselves. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I think there is crossover in some things and we are actively working. I know you know what AJ is working on. Uh, it would be, and, and there's conversations about uh, having that money be directed to CBOs, community-based organizations. And that's what we're hoping will happen eventually, but there's still, dappling in community-based services. Hospitals are still dappling in community-based services. Well, I, I, it's almost shameful uh, the amount of money that they're getting for what appears to be very limited benefits. So my, my thought, but blame AJ for getting me involved in that. <laughs> I'm kind of a pain in the butt for them. <laughs> Excuse my friend. That's a good thing, Phil. <laughs> Sharon, um, Bob Brocker has a comment about, he said, would be interesting to know what percentage of the AAA budget is spent on services versus staff and internal support slash programs. Mm -hmm. And also a question, if AAA suddenly was given $5 million, what would be the priorities for spending? Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, Good question. So um, the the ratio between um, what is contracted versus what is funding internal programs is roughly about it's eighty percent contracted, and then the rate the remainder is um, to those direct programs like the ombudsman program. Obviously, that is a huge program. It's roughly two million a year uh, to be able, and will only receive 
uh, less than two, a ten percent of that from that Title Seven dollars. So that the Part B dollars have to supplement the the ombudsman program. Um, so the um, so that that's that's the split. And if uh, five million dollars was injected into the pro uh, in, in in into the program, then um, that funds distribution process kicks in. So it is again looking at that service, uh, the the services, the need for the service. If it happens partway through the year, we would be due to time constraints. We would work within our our existing group, and so within our existing scope and. Um, uh, only if absolutely needed would we do an RFP, but a lot of times because of the length of time for, um, and you'll see, I, I've got a contract timeline. We, it, it really, there's so many parts to that with having the various approval levels and then the time it takes to contract contract and execute on those. Um, uh, we typically wouldn't release an, an, an RFP. Um, that's not to say that we, ha we haven't done that because, um, in 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 the last five years, we've actually released multiple mid-year RFPs to be able to spend. For instance, the Senate bill when the Senate bill um, 290 funds came, um, and then of course when the COVID stimulus dollars came, we had to release RFPs for those. So those were sort of one um, funding that came outside of our normal grant cycle that we then had to release an RFP. And when an RFP is released, then it, again, it, it will follow that dis funds distribution process. Um, can I, add a little can something? I jump in here for a minute? Oh, oh go ahead, Dawn. Well, the only thing I was going to say is when you look at those RFPs, you know, if we were to receive additional funding, the RFPs that we have that we didn't fund are given consideration um uh in that kind of a process if we if we receive additional funds so we don't always have to go outside for rfps just I think comment. there's also uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we get new funding oftentimes it comes with requirements right from the state or the feds so that directs it as well and then um what we're trying to do is get in those partnerships right with for for example veterans directed um Veteran Instruct is a separate contract and they establish what they want us to do and give us parameters on how we're supposed to use the money and how we're going to report the money. Same way with our HICPUF, uh, our HICPUF contract. Mm -hmm. So those are, um, so there may be a time where we get more money, um, but it's to provide Denver Health is an example. We have a contract with Denver Health. We're doing navigation services for them. Um, they want certain outcomes so then we work towards those outcomes uh i th i think it's important to understand that the majority of the in service or in the in house programs are service programs right they're the ombudsman they're the case managers they're the information assistants they're the ones that are set up setting up transportation there's only a few of us who aren't providing direct services that's sharon's team the admin team and me um so uh, the rest are all service uh, people. Uh, so uh, those are just other other things to be aware of. So, so just a quick follow-up question, and, and thank you for those answers, um, Sharon and Jayla. So what is that 20%, what, what is that in dollars? Uh, in dollars? Uh, so if we have about $23 million of, um, of service allocation. Uh, let's see. That's, that's about four and a half million uh, to the $23 million pot that was available for FY24. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, um, and, and that's multiple programs. I think you've heard about those direct services. Um, that would include like the case management program, the ADRC's information assistance. It also su helps supplement the ship counseling as well as the elder refugee education program. Um, so it's, it's, it's a number of, of, of services. Um, okay. Next question it. in chat, Jayla, is could Part D funds be used to address social isolation issues? Part B 
D is in David. D is evidence-based, right? Um, and so it would have to fall into the category of evidence-based services. And this is a program that the state is pretty tricky about because we keep on trying to fit programs in there, but if they don't have that federal designation of evidence-based, then we can't fund them with Part D dollars. Is that correct, Sharon? Yes, yeah, so we, we do have a list, National Council on Aging um, and COA. They um, have a list of vetted uh, programs that are deemed evidence-based. If um, they will entertain um, some programs outside of that, but it, it follows a very strict um, uh, sort of um, review process um, in order to be able to be considered evidence-based. So tip, I would say pretty much you'd have to be on that list to be able to be funded, which again, makes Part D dollars sometimes, um, uh, you know, a little difficult to spend as well if you're only limited to what is recognized as evidence-based. And so I think is on that list. Um, and that's one reason why, you know, we can fund capable as an evidence-based program under Part D, but it is challenging to find uh, programs that qualify under that service. And that is one of those um, feedback, uh, the feedback that I'll give to the rulemaking process in the Older Americans Act. So I think the PEARLS program we're starting helps address social isolation. I know we're starting that with just caregivers because usually social isolation is intertwined with depression and PEARLS is that evidence-based program to reduce that depression and isolation. So, you know, Sharon knows my goal is to expand it beyond caregivers. So I'm going to put a little plug in for that here. <laughs> yes. And, and I will say, I mean, the, the, the list of evidence-based programs is lengthy, um, but it doesn't always make sense to, you know, some of them are, are very administrative heavy as far as being able to administrate those programs. They, they tend to be very expensive. So when we're trying to spend or also spread the dollars um, and at the same time admit, you know, ensure that we're serving as many people as possible, um, it, it is hard to find um, the best fit when it comes to evidence-based, funding evidence-based programs. And then the, another comment is, it would also be helpful to see a list of who provides what services under which uh, funding source, what are AAA programs versus other providers? Of course, I've got all these icons in the way. Other providers who are funding under the various categories. I think it would provide great clarity of the system and help us talk about what AAA is doing. Sure. Um, you know, when it comes to the way those are allocated, it, it also, um, it has, it, it, you know, in the case of the COVID money, you know, sometimes it has to be somewhat fluid too, um, or, and, and uh, in order to spend the state dollars so that we are not forfeiting, um, you know, if you're a contractor, many of you are aware that sometimes we have to do amendments toward the end of the year just to ensure that we are spending those dollars. So oftentimes, um, even our with our direct programs, give us a little bit of flexibility in that way to be able to spend those state dollars so that they're not forfeited when um, contracted providers are unable to spend the dollars. So there's a little bit of a, you know, um, I, I guess some some flexibility needed when it comes to allocating those dollars, but um, you know, I I can certainly provide in 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 a separate presentation kind of how those um, services are funded by part if that is of interest. So we also have the what we call the blue book. Um, so Mindy, maybe you could send out the more comprehensive version. Yeah. I can do that. I think I will wait, though, um, once our new contractors go into effect okay. July 1st, then we'll update it. I okay. think give them an older version. And then we will send you, so that, that book tells who we're funding and what we're funding them for. And it has the uh, um, 
by uh, it's by category is it by category or is it by it's by service by service um, mm -hmm. yeah okay hey this is jim dale i sharon has said we have to spend but i know that sharon has a list of more needs than the, the money it's available. So when we say have to spend, some people would probably beat on us for saying that, but the needs are much greater than those funds we say, quote unquote, we have to spend or give them back. So I, I, I just wanna make that point, it's really important. And I know everybody probably on the call, uh, Zoom knows that. Yeah, that's important. Um, sometimes like right now, we'll, so it's the end of the year, right? For us, at the end of the state fiscal year. And we will realize that not all, or our contractors will tell us they haven't spent all of their money. Um, we then try and get the money out as quickly as we can so that we don't have to give any back. Uh, so sometimes CGS is a common Co Colorado Gerontological Society, they do, visually visual and hearing services for us we will give them money quickly because they can allocate it quickly and get eyeglass one-time service eyeglasses hearing aids something like that for individuals so that the money can be spent appropriately um, we, we hate it if you're in a position where you're actually looking for silly things to spend and it used to be like that a long time ago where oh no we have X amount of money. So we got to buy stuff for, you know, computers or whatever. It's not like that anymore. It really does go to services. Um, and, uh, but we always have to prepare for that because you don't want to turn money back if you can help it. Yeah. And, and I would say that that's probably just been, I guess, more of an issue lately uh, with, um, uh, during COVID, because with the pandemic, it really just threw a wrench um, with services and not only um, with just the impact on, um, on, on, on the providers being able to provide the service because they either couldn't go inside the home or clients were not, yeah, they don't have the staff. Staffing is a huge issue. Um, you know, the rising costs of service. I mean, there were some pretty variable costs during COVID. And, you know, when you are dealing with a one year time horizon with the contracts, it is, it can be a challenge. And um, some, you know, I'll find that some providers are um, leery of asking for funds that they know that they can spend because they don't, they don't want to be viewed as someone who can't spend uh, those dollars, but there are a lot of factors that are out of their control as well. And so we, um, you know, in, in these last few years, there there were additional challenges. We've we've you know some providers have had to walk away from uh, various services just because it was no longer viable for them to provide that service. Um, so, I mean, there's there's really a whole, uh, a, a lot of factors that have to be considered. And going back to Phil's question, as far as the art of looking at those costs, you know, it, it you know, every agency has, is, is different and some have access to additional funds and can provide a really strong matching, uh, you know, strong match. Um, and others are less liquid and it's a real struggle for them. And so any change can really have a profound impact in their ability to provide services. All of that has to be taken into account when we're looking at those budgets. Um, so there are AAAs that they set a rate and they say, this is the only amount that we're going to pay for that service. Um, and, but we also understand we understand that every, you know, providers have different situations and those have to be taken into account um, when we look at their, um, at, at, at their costs. So, um, so anyway, I'll just sort of leave that at that and, and uh, keep going since I know we're, we're time limited. Um, I did a funding presentation earlier, so I didn't want to go into too much detail about funding, but just so you have an idea um, of kind of how the 
that 23 million is broken out for fiscal year 2024. Um, what's not included is a projection, a projected um, carryover of older Americans Act funds. It's probably going to be close to six hundred thousand um, dollars, but those monies are not allocated to contractors until we formally receive that in a in in a contract from the state. So those dollars. Um, while anticipated would not be included in the in the in the contract allocations. Um, and the 387 for homestead that is sort of a fraction of what we've gotten in this final year of homestead dollars we're we're um, getting only about a third of what we would normally get for state homestead and then those dollars um, will not come back next year. And as I said um, bef before, with the ARPA dollars, those expire in September of 2024. So those go away as well. So that would be then um, when it comes down to um, figuring out how to prioritize funding when we're going to be getting so much less in fiscal year 2025. We're really going to be looking at those um, at that process and making sure that we are prioritizing. Um, the services um, with through that procedure that we have um, outlined. So um, again, this is kind of speaking to how that 23 million was allocated. 16 and a half million were issued as grants to community-based providers. Um, there was that other two and a half million for fee for service um, uh, contracts budgeted um, and then the remainder went to the direct service programs of the AAA. And then just briefly, this is how those allocations are, um, are, are, are spread across the various services. So this really is just to demonstrate how we are really um, sort of following that um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you can see the transportation, nutrition, and even with the, in the homemaker and personal care services, those comprise a large, um, um, approximately half of the funding pot. Um, then goes to the next level of safety needs, which is the ombudsman, the material aid, the legal assistance, and the caregiver support, and then up the chain. So um, the funding allocations are reflecting those priorities. And so I just wanted to show that to you for. Um, for the fiscal year 24 period. And then just lastly, I just wanted to, this is the, the contracts timeline. Uh, I inserted this mainly just to show you that, you know, when the process of reviewing the um, proposals and, 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 the, and the funding requests came in in January, we went through a very rigorous process of getting through the review, the funding subcommittee, um, really um, always steps up every every time to to evaluate those proposals, make those recommendations in a timely way so that the board can approve them in April. And then um, only until the state legislature has wrapped up their um, session and um, determining how much the budget would be, um, we have to wait to receive our contract from the state. And so there's no um, final funding amount until uh, we get that contract, which is typically in May. But as many of you know, the, the legislature can extend beyond May. And, and uh, we sometimes don't know what our funding is until June. And those services are supposed to start in July. Um, so in the event, obviously, that funding is a lot less than what we um, anticipated, then we would have to go through a process of then uh, with the funding subcommittee and making evaluating those um, allocations and making a recommendation to re reduce as, as needed. We do have language in our contracts that say, you know, funding is, contract funding is subject to available funds. Um, during my time, I we've Fortunately, have not had to um, amend those contracts after we've already issued them immediately after we've released them. Um, however, um, you know, with the 
carryover that we off, often might, uh, would receive midway during the, the year, we take that opportunity to be able then to make adjustments to those allocations. Um, so um, again, and I, and I would just uh, reiterate from your previous discussion about ad advocacy that, you know, what we've learned um, from having had the COVID stimulus dollars is that it's, it's particularly helpful when you can have a longer time horizon, like with the ARPA monies being, um, you know, more, more than just one year, it's helpful to have that longer horizon. It's helpful to have that flexibility between the funding parts. Um, I know when we had those visually impaired funds, we could only use them for visually impaired program uh, uh, services, um, but it also made it a bit of a challenge when it came to, um, you know, uh, making sure that we spent those funds and, now we still fund those programs, but they just fall under the general material aid, counseling and education. Um, it's just not an earmarked set of funds. Anyway, Thank you, um, Sharon. Yeah. Thank you. If it, I would suggest if you have any other questions, let's email Sharon. We are a half an hour off track. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, but thank you so much, Sharon. And I appreciate that um, in-depth explanation. Yes, but Rich, um, do you have a quick update for us? How about, I, I assume you all read the attachment. <laughs> Let's assume. And, <laughs> and I could just see if there's any questions uh, or if requests for detail on something. Thank you for that. <laughs> any questions for Rich? Okay, thank you, Rich. So you bet. I'll just questions. say I'm I'm actually more interested in talking about the upcoming session and the funding issues and the budget issues, anyway. And I will say that that uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm already working on this stuff. We've had a meeting with Jared Hughes in the governor's office. We're trying to get a meeting with JBC staff persons uh, and so forth. So um, I don't know how we want to follow up with this group going forward. Um, but uh, the work has begun on this for the coming uh, budget year. Wonderful. And it sounds like there's a lot of interest with this group in the advocacy. So it'll be yeah. nice to see what happens there as uh, a- We're gonna need as much advocacy as we can get. And uh, I don't think we need to wait too much longer <laughs> before we well, start it up. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, and, thank you. And to support Rich's uh, gray gray hair, it's it's not that the work is beginning; it's continuing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I think what I'd like to do, maybe Carrie, is put this on the agenda for next time, and Rich and I can meet in between, kind of outline where we are, where what some key points that we're doing, some timelines, and then talk about when uh, how how we think we can engage you all. That sounds great because okay. we don't Good. have time to do that now. Um, so we'll- Could, Rich, could Rich help us by telling us the House uh, members, the new chair of the JBC, because Rachel Sensinger is not the chair of this next year. Well, it, it would most likely be, uh, or if tradition holds it, it would be Shannon Bird. Good. Okay. And then she's definitely someone we can talk to and who will listen to us. For sure. Wonderful, thank you, Rich. I would like to move on to the Dr. Cog board report, Steve, or Wynn. Yeah, good or afternoon, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off and if Wynn has stuff to add, we'll uh, we'll go there. Just a couple of things from our most recent meeting. We uh, had a report on the RTD Northwest Rail uh, peak service study. Northwest Rail is something that came out of a vote of voters back in, I think, 2004, and they're still working at trying to develop that that would provide light rail service to Longmont and other areas. So they're working on that and gave us a report. That's still a long way off. Um, this fits in with what, what, what Sharon just did. And by the way, kudos for mentioning Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I geeked out on that. Um, 
we had an overview of the statewide transportation program distribution process. The Metro Denver area gets about 30% on, on ballparking of state highway dollars, et cetera, although we've got a larger population. And it's one of those, those budget battles, just like the, the uh, AAA faces in terms of, of funding. Uh, we got an update on RTD zero fare for better air. Wynn made reference to this earlier in chat. Uh, they are doing it in July and August this year. So starting July 1st and running all the way through August, light rail, uh, light rail buses, uh, RTD services are free. Uh, so encourage people to take advantage of that. Uh, and then I think that's pretty well it there. Uh, I, I was honored to be able to be the guest on No Copay Radio a couple of weeks ago. So I enjoyed doing that and thank Jayla and Murphy for being great hosts and making me feel very welcome. Wynn, do you have anything else? No, I think that was a great summary. Uh, I, I would add on a more local basis, I think, Carrie, if you hear of Douglas County seniors who need help as a result of the tornado. Um, you know, uh, I, I know the commissioners, I guess I were going to be surveying the damage at three. So, uh, you know, I guess let me know, but they're, you know, I'm sure they're willing to help, mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like there would be some cleanup. I've got a lot that I haven't done yet yeah. uh, in my own yard. So um, thank you for mentioning that. I did notice while we were on the call that something came through that it from the county that it was declared a disaster area within that region where the tornado and the big storm hit. So um, I bet we'll be getting a lot of phone calls when and I'll yeah. keep the loop. And please do the same because we can dispatch volunteers out. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's great. It was odd. It the I don't know if you all saw the map, but the tornado stopped at the border of the city of Lone Tree. It just lifted off the ground right there. It was very peculiar, except that there are some power lines right there. And tornadoes and electricity seem to have a, a, a weird relationship. And uh, I think we can only be grateful in Lone Tree that, you know, we we didn't have the direct hit, but we sure had a lot of damage and flooding. Right. Yeah, that was a scary storm last night. It was scary. <laughs> scary, awesome. yes. So... Um, all right. How about any can other? I make one more, one more real quick. Phil made reference to you can always ride your bike for free. He was being kind of uh, funny, but uh, I do want to mention that Bike to Work Day is Wednesday, uh, which is a, a big project of, of Dr. Cog, the Way to Go program, and uh, just encourage everybody to take advantage of the uh, the hospitality stations in the morning and afternoon, and enjoy Bike to Work Day, and hope that the weather holds out because we don't need that to occur on one of those days like yesterday. We don't. And thank you for remembering. You'd think I would have remembered that Bike to Work Day is on Wednesday. I did get a really nice t-shirt from my husband this year. So I love the logo this year. Um, okay. Any other county reports? And look at us. We're actually going to end on time. Oh, my goodness. County reports. Well, I can tell you very quickly, Douglas County is going to be holding a series of 11 listening tours starting in July so that we can go out to um, different parts of the county and hear from our older residents what is most important, what are we doing right, what do we need to do better, maybe even what do we need to do different. So that will be happening over the next several months. And then we will be gathering that information and looking at possibly changing things, adding to things. I don't know, but I'm real excited about the opportunity to get out and, and listen to uh, different parts of the county because it's very different in Larkspur than it is in Lone Tree. So that'll be really interesting. Jim. Yes, I don't speak for the county, but two real quick things. I got a chance to zoom in on the Board of Health, which I haven't done actually since I got off 
out of Jefferson County Public Health, but the Emergency Preparedness Group has got a older adult partnership grant. And I think it'll be great. Maybe they'll be coordinating with the age-friendly Jefferson County Steering Committee and that, but it's all about how about uh, systems that have been built in the past about age-friendly public health services. So uh, colleagues and friends of mine are I mean, working that, reaching out and trying to build co coalitions. So, so addressing needs and gaps. And I, I think that's just pretty exciting. The second one was something I saw in the New York Times was a rural community in California where they got federal money to put in electric vehicle stations and they had friends driving friends versus this was an alternative to Uber and Lyft. But so some community people got some grant money for old EVs and the EV stations were put in by the feds. So I don't know how that affects us. It's just something to put in the back of our minds on transportation and maybe more so with our friends in some of the rural areas, who knows? Thank you. Jim, I have a question about that. So did the grant cover the cost of the charging stations and the older vehicles? You're, I can't hear you. I know, it's, I know it was the charging stations. I can't swear okay. on the vehicles. I think they got some money for some of the vehicles, but you know, there's so many of those, it was more in a migrant worker uh, established town where lots of people didn't have vehicles at all. And so right. they had the old bolts and things like bolts and things like that, that uh, and leafs that could drive people around and they'd come back home and charge them up. So That's pretty cool. It was, it was cool. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be to... quiet so we get it done in time. <laughs> I mean, I'm so proud of us. My goodness, we're only three minutes behind. Any other matters from anyone? Yep. This is Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> I just wanted to remind people of the webinar that we're holding on Monday. Um, you mentioned uh, your interest in hearing from external experts. And so we have uh, three really good subject matter experts talking all about nutrition, the medical impact of nutrition, uh, mapping, uh, food access, and then Project Angel Heart is going to give us a good profile of, of their incredible program. Oh, nice. Very nice. So you want to tell them how to access the information, Kelly? I, I could send out the uh, log on to it again to all of you. They can, yeah, also, they can also go on to the Dr. Cog website and okay. to the calendar of events. And on the 26th, you'll see that it's listed there. And if you click on it, it's got the link right there. Perfect. And I did see the email come through, but maybe send it again, Kelly. Why not? Okay. I'm happy to do that. All right. Good to see everybody. Maybe we'll see you in person soon. <laughs> right. Have a good July. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.